Hi again everybody and welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about precipitation. Now as you can see I have my little face up here in the upper left hand corner and it's because I'm going to be showing you a demonstration later. So with that said let's jump in. Now before we can really talk about types of precipitation we need to talk about how precipitation forms. And the reason why we need to talk about this is because precipitation can't form the same way that a typical cloud droplet can form. Here's why. One average raindrop is approximately one million times the size of a cloud droplet. Think about that. One million times. Any of us have a million dollars? I don't. So if you think about that, really, in order for you to go from a cloud droplet to a raindrop would take one million times the length it takes for one cloud droplet to form. Just by that logic, I'm, I'm not even taking things into consideration such as surface tension or, or surface area to mass ratio and all the other fun things that really make it complicated to go from a typical cloud droplet like this little guy here to a raindrop over here. As a result, condensation can't form raindrops. It's just too slow. Think of it, if it took one second, just one second to form one cloud droplet, it would take a million seconds to form one raindrop. And again, that's taking all of the other complications out that actually prove that it would take much longer. Things such as surface tension and so on. But we're not going to talk about that. That's beyond the scope of this course. So with that said, precipitation can't form by condensation. Something else needs to happen. Something else needs to happen. Well, let's talk about what that something else is. As I just mentioned, raindrops are much larger than cloud droplets, so condensation can't really do it. So what does do it? What creates raindrops? Well, there's actually two potential mechanisms involved, and it depends on the type of cloud. We've talked about the Howard's classification in a previous video. We're not going to talk about that here. When I talk about clouds, I'm talking about one of two types of clouds, either warm clouds or cold clouds. In the case of a warm cloud, the temperature at the top of the cloud is warmer than the freezing level. Therefore, all the, all the droplets, all of the water inside this cloud is liquid or water vapor, but we don't worry about that. Just It's all liquid inside the cloud. The cloud is entirely liquid. There's no ice. In this case, the precipitation method that creates the cloud is called collision and coalescence. On the other hand, if the top of the cloud is colder than zero degrees Celsius, we call that a cold cloud. In the case of a cold cloud, there's some ice involved. And that ice actually ends up winning in a pretty interesting battle called the Bergeron process. So I'm going to talk very briefly about each one of these processes. You don't have to understand them intimately. You just need to know the very nitty gritty basics of each one of these. Well, let's talk about collision and coalescence first. So the reason why I have myself in this, in this video right now, the reason why I have my mug showing in this video right now is because collision and coalescence actually involve something pretty big. So the way collision and coalescence works is not all cloud droplets are alike. Some are bigger, some are smaller. And this could be due to a million different things, either random collisions, different condensation nuclei, or so on. But what you end up getting is you end up getting cloud droplets of different sizes. Now, large droplets 
fall faster than, slow dro or than small droplets. So large droplets fall faster than small droplets. Most people think that it's because the large droplets are heavier. Well, to disprove that, I have two things here. Now I'm going to bring this up a little bit further. So here I am. Hi. I have two things right here. First, I have my car keys. Pretty heavy. Pretty heavy. On the other hand, I have an emptied out pouch. Very light. Right? If you don't believe me, you can come to my office and make an appointment. I'll have you hold these two things and tell me which one's heavier. But based on the logic that the heavier one falls faster, if I were to drop these two at the same time, the keys would land first. But look what actually happens. So here's my desk. All right. Make sure these are both in the picture. This right here is the lighter pouch. This right here is the heavier keys. Now I'm going to lift them up to the same height. I promise you I'm not lowering them or making one lower than the other. Watch what happens. Let's see that again, this time from a little bit lower of a perspective. They hit at the same time. I could drop them even higher. Watch. They hit at the same time. All right. They hit at the same time. So believe it or not, heavier objects don't necessarily travel faster than small objects. Heavier objects don't necessarily travel faster than smaller objects or lighter objects. All right, now I can move my mug over here. Bye, everybody. <laughs> All right. So with that said, larger droplets actually fall faster because they have less drag. Actually, let me get myself back up over here. Let me show you how. So, here I have a piece of paper, old assignment from last quarter. Watch what happens when I drop this. Do you notice how it just drifts to the ground? It doesn't fall fast like either the keys or the pouch. Well, here's why. Now, let me grab another one. Here's why. Because this paper is all surface area, meaning the entire mass of this paper is all concentrated on the exterior. It's all surface area. Small droplets are like giant pieces of paper like this. Most of their mass is concentrated on their exterior, so they waft down. On the other hand, larger droplets have most of their mass concentrated inside the droplet, hence they fall faster. And so the collision to coalescence process looks something like, let me get this back, this. So here's the paper. Yeah, I'll, I'll use the pouch just so it doesn't hurt my lap. Paper, key, pouch. Something like that. You have the faster falling droplet colliding with the smaller, slower traveling droplet, and they stick together, forming a new droplet. Now I can say goodbye to myself. There you go, get out of the way. There. So these larger droplets collide with the smaller droplets. And that process is called coalescence. Now, coalescence depends on a lot of things. Coalescence depends on the charges of the droplets. If the two droplets have different charges, they stick together easier. If they both have the same charge, they repel each other. And so that makes a big deal. Or that makes a big difference. So again, the way this works is you have all of these small cloud droplets and then larger droplets fall faster because they have less drag and hence they quickly move down and ram into these smaller droplets colliding with them and combining with them. Now, 
With that said, what allows a raindrop to become so big depends on what's going on inside the cloud, specifically the updrafts inside the cloud. Updrafts keep raindrops suspended inside the cloud so they can grow bigger and bigger and bigger. If you have a strong updraft, it slows the rate of descent, allowing the droplet to stay large or to become large. On the other hand, if there's no big updraft, the droplet falls out a lot quicker. Stronger updrafts can also push the droplet higher, increasing the time it spends in the cloud. And the longer the droplet spends in the cloud, the bigger it can become. Eventually, the droplet becomes too heavy, the updraft can't hold it anymore, and it falls to the ground. In the case of strong updrafts, by the time these raindrops hit the ground, they could become gigantic. So if you've ever been in, such, in something like a tropical storm or any kind of like very major rainstorm where it's just dumped buckets of rain on you, it's probably because there was a strong updraft allowing the raindrop to continue to grow inside the cloud. And then eventually the rain droplet just falls down. So it's like this. If you have an updraft, and these are caused by warm rising air, watch the previous three lectures to review that. These updrafts take the cloud droplets and suspend them in the cloud making it harder for them to fall out of the cloud. They grow larger and larger and larger until they're too heavy to stay in the cloud, then they fall out. Now what depends or what determines how big a raindrop is, is the range of the droplet sizes. You need those larger, faster falling droplets for all of this to happen. If all the droplets are all the same size, you're not going to get this. The cloud has to be thick because the thicker the cloud, the more moisture is available, the more droplets are available, the more time the droplet is going to spend in the cloud, the bigger it's going to become. You need strong updrafts and you need oppositely charged droplets. So those are all the things that determine how big droplets can get in warm clouds. Cold clouds are a completely different monster. Cold clouds are clouds where the temperature at the top is below freezing. A good example of this would be a cumulonimbus cloud, but even many stratus clouds also can be cold clouds. In the case of a cold cloud, precipitation forms via what's called the Bergeron process. Now, if you recall the last module, I talked for a few minutes about what's called saturation vapor pressure. If you don't remember saturation vapor pressure, pause this lecture, go back to the previous module, check it out. I'll give you some time to do that. Alright, assuming that you recall what saturation vapor pressure is, let's move on and talk about it. So here's how the Bergeron process occurs. First off, believe it or not, this is actually what forms almost all, if not all of the precipitation here in the mid-latitudes, even during the summertime. Most of the rain that we get here starts off as ice crystals in the atmosphere. Now with that said, if you actually went into a cold cloud, you would think that it's all just ice, right? Temperatures below 32 degrees, it should be nothing but ice. But guess what? That's not true. Believe it or not, the temperature, even though it's below 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius, is still warm enough to allow for tiny super cooled liquid droplets to exist. And in fact, these supercooled liquid droplets can exist in temperatures as low as 40 below zero. And that's in either Celsius or Fahrenheit. Do the math, the two are equal to each other. Um, if you've never done that before, it actually won somebody $250,000 or $50,000 who wants to be a millionaire. 
pretty cool story. But anyway, so ice crystals and liquid cloud droplets are present in these cold clouds. And so these liquid droplets, they exist. They're what are called super cooled liquid droplets, but they still exist. Now, if you recall from the last module, if you actually zoom in at the body of either one of these ice crystals or liquid cloud droplets, you would see two things happening. You would see water vapor molecules escaping. That's called evaporation and returning. That's called condensation. In the case of saturated air, the two are equal to each other. Evaporation and condensation are equal to each other. As a result, though, you have ice crystals where this is happening and cloud droplets where this is happening. These ice crystals also grow on something very similar to the liquid droplets. These are called ice nuclei. But what actually happens is cloud droplets are actually much more abundant than ice crystals. However, these cloud droplets actually begin to evaporate, whereas ice crystals begin to grow. Here's why this happens. The saturation vapor pressure at the surface of the ice crystal is a little bit lower than it is over the surface of the supercooled droplet. Again, we talked about that in the previous module. Saturation vapor pressure is a little bit lower. What that means is that even if the air over the liquid droplet is unsaturated, the air over the ice crystal might still be saturated. So what actually happens is net evaporation begins to occur over the liquid droplets. And all of that moisture that quickly evaporates makes the air over the ice more saturated. Therefore, all of those little water vapor molecules stick to the ice crystal. So many supercooled water droplets surround each ice crystal. The air is saturated in both cases. However, there are more water vapor molecules leaving the liquid droplet than the ice crystal. And then they immediately go and stick to the ice crystal. As a result, the ice crystal grows, the water droplets shrink. It looks like this. Ice crystal grows, water droplets shrink. And again, this happens because the air over the ice crystal is more saturated than the air over the water droplet. As a result, there's more water evaporating off the droplet and going and sticking to the ice crystal. Now, you don't need to understand that intimately. What I do want you to understand is in the Bergeron process, ice crystals grow at the expense of liquid droplets. That's really what I really want you to get out of this. You don't have to understand at least intimately why that happens. But the reason why it happens is because the air here is more saturated than the air here. And it occurs because the saturation vapor pressure here is lower than it is over the liquid droplet. With all of that said, in a cloud, this ice crystal will grow larger and larger and larger until it becomes big enough to fall. As it falls, it collides with other supercooled water droplets, which freeze on contact, creating little snow pellets. Then these ice crystals fracture, they collide with other ice pellets, and this causes them to take on shapes like that of snowflakes. And the reason why this happens is because as the crystal is falling, 
it has the same forces acting on it on all sides. So that causes things to split off and splinter uniformly, creating snowflakes. So it looks something like this. You have a falling ice crystal. Many super cool droplets stick to it. They form grapple. This grapple then collides and fractures into many different particles. And then they grow together, producing snowflakes. Now, with all that said, let's talk about rainfall for a moment. And this will be the last thing we talk about in this lecture. So, many of the snowflakes melt as they begin to fall towards the ground. This is because the air near the ground is very warm. The air near the ground is very warm. So, much of the rain that we actually get starts off as snow, and then it melts into rain. Now, obviously, if the air between the cloud and the ground is all freezing, then it falls as snow. But even in the summertime, most of the rain that we get starts out as snow, even in the summertime. Now with that said, if you've ever heard of cloud seeding, cloud seeding is an attempt to create more ice crystals. And the reason why this happens is because in the upper atmosphere, there aren't a lot of ice nuclei. However, if we add more ice nuclei to the atmosphere, if we seed the clouds with more ice nuclei, that can cause them to grow. That can cause more ice crystals to grow, which means more raindrops, which means more rain. In order for this to work, you need a cloud, supercooled water, and a good ice nuclei. And usually the one that we use is silver iodide. However, cloud seeding also happens by Mother Nature. There's actually areas downwind of the mountains, on the lee side of mountains, where as air rises up and over the mountain, it can actually sometimes cause very high-level clouds to form. Those high-level clouds can actually seed lower clouds, causing droplets in those lower clouds to grow, causing ice crystals in those clouds to grow, creating more snow. Now with that said, the way all of this happens is in strongly convective clouds, these are clouds where you go from clear skies to severe thunderstorm in minutes, precipitation can begin very quickly. And it usually occurs either by collision and coalescence or by the Bergeron process. However, in more typical clouds and less convective clouds, such as nimbostratus clouds and other stratiform clouds, usually collision and coalescence doesn't set up fast enough. Therefore, the Bergeron process is the one that really happens. You get these ice crystals that develop, they feed off the water surrounding them, they grow, and then they fall. And then they melt as they fall, forming rain. Now, that's it for this lecture. The next lecture we're